Well, good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, great pleasure uh, tonight to introduce our speaker, Dr. David Jones, very well known to many of you. I won't give you all his uh, titles, but um, essentially he's uh, an anesthetic specialist and pain specialist, pain, pain treatment specialist, among other things, lecturer in the university as well. Anyway, uh, we're going to hear tonight about the intriguing Dr. John Wilkins, MRCS. And um, we'll just hear what you have to say, David, with intrigue. Thank you. Thank you for coming tonight and uh, those at home for listening. I, I heard very little about uh, Dr. Wilkins uh, throughout the period of time from 1992 when he warranted about two sentences in a talk that Professor Barry Baker gave about anesthesia. And Dr. Basil Hutchison, what was the earliest anesthesia in this city? And uh, there was a connection with ether and that was about it. It went into the ether for many years. But uh, I did do a talk about uh, Isaiah de Zouche, uh, about a year and a half ago, and his name just went in passing and I did not recognize the significance of it at that time. So tonight I hope that uh, some of that will be revealed. Um, there are parts of this where the text is a bit too much to put on slides and I will read little sections, uh, some of it to show a little bit of the character of our subject. And there's a, a, a range of, um, which one? So, okay, so uh, the, about the end of last year, I was wondering whether I would have enough material to make a talk out of this. Now I'm thinking I've got more than I can actually fit in it. So it, there's a bit of a method in that madness. Uh, if you go looking, you can find stuff. Now that's a fairly long list of things that I uh, expect to cover in brief. Um, but effectively, um, in this city in particular, there was a few things I've changed the words from what was in the flyer, from uh, back, professional backstabbing to inventor and acrimony and uh, stuff like that. But uh, there's a little twist to the end of the story about this man. So basically, it's, it's biographical, but uh, we'll cover a little bit of medicine uh, along the way. So the medical topics that are going to be included are uh, things that at least I think there are one or two people in this room know something about how to uh, recognize. But um, diphtheria, of course, is not something we know these days, but uh, I'll uh, attend to that. Ether's gone out of the, out of the door, but um, are there enough people in the room that to remember A&T Burtz, the engineers? Yes, okay. And uh, some of the early... Uh, uh, eye surgery that uh, he did was probably well ahead of his time. So we don't have a lot of information about his background. I'll show you a little bit more of that shortly, but we know that he was born in Paul at Somerset in England only from his stating that on his marriage or when his marriage certificate was written up. His father was named John Wilkins as well. Uh, as a gentleman, no indication of his background. <laughs> so um, after that, there's a complete absence of any information about his background, any other family that he came from, etc. And that's quite different from the previous two characters that I've brought here, biographical stories. So he went to King's College Hospital London for his uh, training, did the first MB and skipped the second part and went straight on to do the MRCS uh, examination, finishing um, 1849. Late, later on, he, in statements he made, he indicated that between the, or in the years of his studentship, at, he had been a visiting medical student at Moorfields, uh, which is not too far and it's interconnected with what uh, King's College Hospital was. So only 10 months after he graduated, there's only a tiny snippet of information that may or may not be correct of him doing any work between graduating and heading off on a boat to Adelaide in Australia, age 23. 
arrives there in the middle of June, and that was the a time when the, the ships were beginning to get inhabitants to go and uh, fill up the colonies, and that was the fifth of the such ships, so they were mostly government passengers. And he was the surgeon superintendent and responsible for 223 passengers or souls. The actual numbers of people they calculate is smaller because the children and the like gives a, a lower number. So one of the passengers uh, that stood out was uh, Henry uh, Turton because he wrote a journal of everything that went on during the, during the trip and he was 15 years of age. It's just the a uh, little bit that shows you there were 75 children under the age of 14. A couple of them were under the age of uh, one. This is Port Adelaide as it would have been close to the time that he arrived. And uh, the trip was pretty uneventful, non-stop for about four months. And he was to be paid 10 shillings for each live passenger landed. Not quite sure whether that was uh, taking account of the extras that were born on the way and uh, subtracted for the ones that died. But anyway, there were four births and three, three deaths buried at sea. The, when they arrived in Adelaide, the um, Adelaide Times had a little bit that said what a favourable uh, voyage it had been. There had been no infectious epidemics and that had been quite a common occurrence on many of the uh, ships like this. Given that there were 75 children, there was plenty of potential for that. And that's what they had to say on the newspaper. Everything on board was in admirable order and the immigrants must have been brought out with much care. Well, he would have been supervising how they, anybody that got a bit of a fever or whatever, got uh, isolated, very topical in recent years for us. So I'm going to bring a few of the extracts out of um, Henry Turton's um, uh, journal and the bits that are highlighted are the important bits because there's too much text to read otherwise but uh, he, he documents a child uh, dying of infantile fever and the doctor having him buried at sea pretty much straight away and then by the time he gets up in the morning there's another one who died of the same complaint and I'm not sure how that's justified the doctor's uh, description I guess. Then the next day, just as he was falling asleep, uh, the doctor roused him and told him there was going to be another ship on the uh, horizon. So he quickly gets dressed and comes off on deck and is honoured with the title of April Fool. I think it shows you a little bit about Dr. Wilkins and his character, just put that in. And then um, there was the invalids, the, the doctor invalids were the people that were sort of down below decks and uh, he ordered them to come um, to come up on deck and the heat was pretty high, 80 degrees is about 27 degrees centigrade. It's warm for Dunedin people anyway. And uh, uh, one, one whose face the doctor had slapped considerably hard as a remedy, writes uh, Henry Turton, had a black eye and a swollen face as a result of last night's treatment. Pretty good uh, bit of medical care. And um, the, the trunk that uh, Henry Turton had had his things on downstairs came back up with all these Milton uh, writings in it where it had gone mouldy. That's a great way to carry your things around the world. But the captain and the doctor had been trying to shoot numerous birds which had been flying about during the day. They did not, however, succeed in killing any. So he's not a very good shot. And then uh, the couple of days later, the doctor read the service on the deck and uh, there was a much better congregation than usual. I don't know what that says about Dr. Wilkins, but uh, the baby, one of them that had been born on the trip, just three weeks old, was again brought up for inspection. There's a uh, great improvement in it. It had lost the red face and now looks more like a human being. As we're all anxious to know the length of such a creature, well described, it was measured and found to be 15 inches in length and four across. Um, didn't do a head circumference. And that. Um, now the doctor's smart waistcoat afforded the company some general amusement. 
And uh, the doctor's also concerned about Mrs. Tucker, who's dangerously ill of fever and seems to have rather bare hopes of her recovery. But in fact, later on, you can read that she recovered quite well. So his prognostications, uh, prognostications weren't all that spot on. And then Henry slipped on the, on the decks and it was to the amusement of the not retired company, the doctor being amongst them. So he it looked as if he stayed up late. Well, he certainly did. With Mrs. Wright, who uh, delivered a little boy the next morning, and uh, he had been up all night. And to while away his time, he tied the first, uh, the second mate to his bedpost where he was asleep. So he's a bit of a wag, this Dr. Wilkins. And Henry Turton wasn't the only person who was writing on the trip. Uh, Dr. Wilkins was writing a pamphlet which he sent back to the commissioners and commissioners in London that had placed him on this boat as the surgeon superintendent, and that found favour, which comes up in a short time. Uh, about 10 days after arrival in uh, Adelaide, he's in trouble with the law. He, make, he meets the, uh, the court reports on the paper, and uh, it said that uh, he had he was charged with having given, failing to give advice about the case of smallpox on the voyage. And certain witnesses were brought up, the, the matron and uh, uh, the, the master and a couple of others that all said that they never heard him say anything about smallpox, but he had said there'd been some chickenpox. And he, uh, he produced his journal and this mentioned the case as being chickenpox and denied his having told the health officer he had a case of smallpox. So he was the, prompt, the case was dismissed. There'd been a, a bit of a probable mishearing of which pox type he was talking about. Now, which one is the smallpox, which is the chickenpox? We used to have a medical officer of health, uh, former medical officer of health come, he would have known, I'm sure, but which one? Smallpox on the left, yes, that's correct. The, the umbilicated little vesicles in there. So what sort of appointments did he achieve by carrying the favor of the uh, commissioners in London? Well, there's a whole list of them there. Uh, surgeon superintendent, and he's the person who inspects the ships as they arrive and gets made the coroner. He's appointed as a JP and there's reports in the newspapers there of many cases that have nothing to do with anything medical where he's sitting in judgment with another person and and some military appointment which got repeated later in his life as well. So he stuck with those for about 15 years before he went to the UK when they, they, he was replaced for all of them. That's a very substantial salary for the time given that he made about 200 and something pounds for his getting live live landings and he still had the right of private practice. Williamstown was the, the main port of Victoria and this is about the time when the gold rush came along and the ship started arriving in thousands. He bought a quite fair bit of land and then he married uh, Julietta, uh, Julia Henrietta Byrne who was of New South Wales. Her father was from London. And at the end of the following year, their first was born. He owned a lot of properties and a couple of them were hotels. And then he went and built a grand house, uh, which I'll tell you a bit more about later. So that little bit there is the only record that I and somebody else on ancestry researching families that he, he his wife's family fits into, uh, tells where he was born. There's no other record. And you'll see that uh, his father had the same name and was a gentleman. So the house that he set about building uh, in the, um, in the, near the port of uh, Victoria was, he, he named Edin, Edinham House. Now, Edinham is a place in Roxburghshire in Scotland. We're not quite sure why he did that. But some people have, on ancestry have put him down as born there. But this, only that Paulet uh, location uh, with any evidence. But the house that he built there is still standing today and is on the Historic Buildings Trust uh, register. 
it was a traditional doctor's residence for a very long time before it got converted into restaurants. And he leased it out as a hotel for a while, and then he came back to it because his, as his family was uh, increasing. But it has a few notorious uh, events connected with it, one, one of which was the inspector of uh, penal establishments came and some criminals uh, injured him, and he was nursed in the top floor with uh, Dr. Wilkins looking after him, and he died overnight. And that's one notorious uh, event. And uh, being close to the, uh, the harbour, bodies that washed up were brought up to his place as the morgue, and the basement had to be used as a temporary morgue. And a couple of the uh, coronial inquiries took place there. So it sounds a great place to live. So that's where it is. That's what it looked like uh, way back. And you can see he's got a good um, command of the view of the of the bay and interestingly he had a bit of uh, a fling at uh, doing some yachting and he's not far away from the yacht club they have been proximity that drove that and that's what it looks like in 2023 it's uh, a, a, a restaurant the number of children he had is a little bit uh, tricky you'd think you'd get that right but there are birth records that fit the people and the place of birth, and yet there's no track or trace of them on the boats when traveled and things like that. So there's this much, uh, the lack of information about any family, siblings, anything like that. His uh, wife's family has a lot of background history across, and the children could be sort of grouped, grouped in a way. Uh, those, um, those ones were all born in uh, Williamstown, Victoria. Uh, Julia Mary is the only one that uh, married. She married a fairly rich banker from, with a, a Danish background who was in Napier. And there's just one or two traces of her on the electoral rolls for New Zealand. Uh, but she had no issue. And then the uh, other three girls, uh, all, all were spinsters. You can find records of them in probate form. So there's no offspring, grandchildren, generation from Dr. Wilkins. The son, well, there's where, that's what a, a birth notice said, and uh, he just didn't appear anymore. That was the only trace of him. And these three, I'll come to shortly, these first three. Uh, the other two there were born in, uh, in London when he went over for his, his uh, study time. I think you remember the Queen had an Arnus Horribilis. Well, uh, 1863 was an Arnus Horribilis for this family because first of all, we see one death notice, then we see another death notice, and then we see a third death notice. And uh, I made a little table up because I thought there might be some people here who understood infectious diseases better than me and might be able to work out what the incubation times were, et cetera. And this, First one, uh, they're all certified by Dr. John Wilkins, his own family, which is a little bit anomalous in current terms. And uh, it's listed as a mumps laryngitis, but I suspect that it was probably the same as diphtheria as the other two. And uh, show a picture that is my basis for saying that. But I don't know whether this can uh, give any clues about um, the, the infectious time or yeah all years later, so anybody can explain that. Because of these fairly hefty commitments over those 15 years, he, uh, two, about two years after the children had died, there was another one, another young one there that survived and his wife was pregnant during that time as well, and they had one later. But he uh, took a health change break and decided to go back to the UK and where those other two daughters were that born that I showed you. And his wife and children came back earlier than him, and he stayed on for what we would probably call today CPD or postgraduate education. And this was quite notable, and it becomes important for some of the rest of the story. Uh, William Bowman and George Critchett were the two senior ophthalmic surgeons at Moorfields, and they are renowned for or well known for what they pushed in terms of ocular surgery. 
later Sir Mor Morrill Mackenzie uh, was actually a physician laryngologist, but he did get a membership of the Royal College of Surgeons. I don't know quite how you match up a physician and uh, getting that qualification, but his, his specialization was in uh, diseases of the, th of the throat. And Sir William Ferguson, I'll give you a little reference from somewhere else about him in a short while, but he was Scottish originally. But um, just to go through some of these, because there's some important connections of this with people with other history. Um, Sir William Bowman was, uh, first of all, uh, a histologist using the microscope extensively. And we have Bowman's capsule in the kidney, the glomerulus named after him as is the, for any eye people, the uh, layer on the anterior part of the cornea. And I'd never heard of um, uh, the uh, glands in the mucosa before, but it's in his uh, uh, CV. So the time that uh, Dr. Wilkins was um, at, uh, at, at his study time would have overlapped with um, uh, the time that uh, William Bowman was teaching at King's College Hospital. And then his second half of his career was the ophthalmic one at the Royal London Ophthalmic Hospital. And when, when he went over for his uh, postgraduate studies, uh, John Wilkins was appointed by um, George Critchett, who with his son were well-renowned eye people, and uh, as their clinical assistant with a surgical as a surgeon with a surgical qualification. Now that becomes important that terminology later in the story as well. I had the opportunity to cruise past uh, Moorfields recently and this is an up-to-date picture. And uh, just to make sure we could keep an eye on the time, uh, they uh, made it quite easy up there. Uh, now, just around the corner, uh, at Piccadilly is St. James Church, and uh, inside there is a plaque, a uh, memorial plaque for William Bowman. And uh, while taking the photo, I was asked why I had an interest by a lady, a lady um, member of the clergy there. She was a little bit interested that uh, somebody here had had a connection with. Him. But anyway, the, uh, the epitaph, I think, probably is... Uh, meaningful in terms of what it says about eyes and yet cannot see for an ophthalmologist and effectively giving a religious uh, uh, promotion for what they should do if they can't see in the darkness. I'm going to leave this for Terry to come back later because he helped me uh, sort out what it, uh, what it does actually say, but we think it's connected, probably taken out of somewhere where um, Jesus uh, cured the blind man. So Morrill Mackenzie, uh, he was a London person, went around Europe studying the throat and the laryng laryngoscope and laryngoscopy, and he won a prize for uh, something with the, in the College of Surgeons, which is uh, a start. But he had a side chapter, which was not quite so um, illustrious. He, uh, gave, he gave the wrong diagnosis to the German doctors uh, when he was called in because of his fame and, um, in the area. And based on a, a, a sample which was looked at by Virchow, uh, the pathologist of Virchow's triad fame, uh, he declared that the lesion was not malignant. So uh, for who's going to become the Emperor Frederick III, um, that was fine. They didn't take his larynx out at that time as the German doctors were recommending. However, uh, there grew up an argument when he did actually develop a, a proven cancer later and uh, uh, Mackenzie uh, wrote argumentative uh, ref refutation of that, saying it was the treatment the German doctors gave him after that he had cleared him of cancer that uh, caused him to get a cancer. Well, you can read that for yourself. But anyway, it, it probably breached the confidentiality of uh, Frederick uh, III, and he was uh, chastised by the uh, Royal College of Surgeons for this exchange. But he's his reputation recovered later and he went on to still have uh, a, a good uh, write-up. So at the end of 1866, which was that period of time that uh, 
Wilkins had gone back to London for his OE, his CPD, his postgraduate extra work. Uh, he was elected as a fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons, Edinburgh. Now you might see a little pattern of uh, who you know might help in these circumstances because um, he, his two proposers were Sir William Ferguson and Professor James Spence. And uh, the former was uh, the professor of surgery, which uh, overlapped uh, Wilkins' student time there. So almost certainly knew him. And uh, later he became president of the College of Surgeons in England, even though he was a Scot. Uh, but there was a special event that went on when um, Wilkins was in London, and that was a, a celebratory dinner uh, where a very expensive silverware set was presented to Ferguson by uh, 300 or contributed to by 300 of his former pupils at King's College. Uh, I'm going to make hazard of a guess that uh, Wilkins was probably there. It was at the time it happened, and he was. Uh, friendly with him and he referred to him quite a bit when he came back and things he wrote. Uh, and uh, one of the parts of his uh, strength and uh, surgery was con conservation, you know, trying to avoid amputations that didn't need to be done, but especially related to what Wilkins later got into, things to do with the palate, the hair lip and uh, jaw and things were, was uh, McKean, uh, Ferguson's specialties. Not a lot about James Spence, but except that in the tale of the breast is called the tale of Spence in some sources. These are the two nominators and their, um, their prestigious positions they held later. So after that CPD period, uh, Wilkins comes back to Melbourne and he then set about building a very fine house. Uh, which is at 121 Collins Street at the time, renumbered number 70 in later, later years. And then he took up the seven year period of time as uh, an honorary surgeon at the Alfred Hospital. And there are a lot of applicants for some uh, surgeon positions and physician positions. And he was one of two that was chosen out of a large number of applicants for the surgical one. But, he, he established a, a, what's been called a self-supporting infirmary for throat, chest, eye, and ear. Now that's turning some of the words around from what was probably uh, the, the precursor of what's now the Royal Victorian Eye and Ear Hospital, which was founded by these two gentlemen. Now, there is a little uh, contretemps between uh, Gray and uh, Wilkins when Wilkins went to see one of Gray's patients and they agreed to meet at a certain time and Gray didn't turn up. And in the end, Wilkins got to the point where he felt he should see the patient, which he did. And as he came away, Gray arrived and Gray set off complaints about him um, stealing his patients, seeing his patients without him being present. It was actually a referral and he should have been there, et cetera. So there was a bit of antipathy between those people just because Wilkins felt he needed to get on and see the patient. Uh, who, who owns the patient. And I, I put a, a, a variable number there because it depends on, he wrote a lot of papers to the Australian Medical Journal, but uh, it depends on whether you count a three-part series on diphtheria as one or three, uh, what number you get in, in the total. But a lot of them had to do with uh, the things that he'd been connected with in his uh, CPD in London. And just after he comes back, this says that he's resumed his practice uh, the practice of his profession, diseases of the eye, the ear, and the throat. And you'll remember that the occultist versus o o o oculist and occultist uh, in the various things you'll have seen. So the new house uh, became his uh, house and his home and surgery, uh, surgery on the ground floor, living above, and it still stands in this heritage protected. Um, it has been associated with 100 years of surgical practice since he built it, and that's included general eyes and O and G. Eventually, of course, it went to commercial pressures to become offices and the like. But that's a modern day picture of the house he built in Collins Street on the corner. And uh, it's now the headquarters of Rolex Australia on the ground floor. I don't know whether Wilkins would have uh, rejoiced at that or not.
it has a plaque on the side uh, as part of the um, heritage protection. So he kept advertising his return, his presence and what he did. Now advertising is a word that's gonna keep coming up. Um, you'll see that he, he's listing himself as the honorable, uh, honorary surgeon at the Alfred Hospital, subsequently in advertising got re wrongly named the Albert Hospital, and also honorary surgeon in the infirmary for disease of the chest, throat, eye and ear. And look at the hours, they, they work pretty good solid hours. And somewhere else he said that in the between times for these ones, he goes out, he used to go out visiting, but he got to a type of practice where he was only consulting in the end. That, um, th there's another little piece from a group where the um, annual meeting of the subscribers to the self-supporting infirmary, infirmary were read a paper that he wrote about diphtheria. Now that self-supporting infirmary, in fact, was a private hospital that he set up in a bit of competition with the other, um, the other uh, Royal Victorian Eye and Ear stuff. And the, the, there was a bit of a problem with on, the government would only give funding support to one of a type in the city. So his one did, had to get subscribers and other ways of getting funding. But effectively, it was his own institution, and he uses his uh, honorary surgeon there. He was the only surgeon, as far as I can tell, in this, uh, his own private institution. It's quite a while before he turns up as a registered practitioner. This is the uh, UK and Ireland directory of uh, practitioners resident abroad, abroad. But you'll notice that they they list quite a lot of the things that they've contributed in uh, in the literature. We'll look at that closer now. These are the subjects that he wrote on about, and uh, the, the earlier ones were before he went away on his OE, uh, sorry, his CPD. And uh, I, one of them only has much to do with eyes, ears, and nose, etc. And some of the others that he wrote were general surgical types of things. And there is a little bit about medical ethic, etiquette, sorry, which is connected with that contretemps with uh, other people about. Uh, stealing or you know seeing patients without their owner being present so to speak but the, these are all e e ENT type uh, matters and uh, the pin in the larynx there was a, a whole when he presented that to the Victorian Medical Society group there was a whole lot of people said me too without the laryngoscope they argued they didn't need the laryngoscope for that well I'm not going to comment on that but using a laryngoscope without much uh, to suppress the responses to it is not my, uh, not my experience. So the, uh, the local treatment of diphtheria uh, place, uh, posed a big part in things that he did and wrote about. And uh, this, the perfect uh, soft palate needed for good, good articulation. One of his uh, people he spent time with in London was uh, uh, a soft palate repair surgeon. Okay, so uh, a few more there. All, all those ones in blue I've uh, judged to be connected with that specialist interest. These were not in the uh, Australian Medical Journal, but they all center around his advice on treating managing diphtheria. Um, and when he came to New Zealand, he wrote this paper, a little pamphlet, which I'll come back to later. This one was a fairly late uh, event and I haven't uh, set eyes on it yet. And it seems quite a, a stretch to one of the extremes of the spectrum of medical stuff. But this is a very traditional Wikipedia picture of uh, what some of the exudates can be like in diphtheria. And this is probably a mild looking one compared with some of the photos that are there. And uh, I put this in mostly to show that the, the, the big swellings and the like, and this was supposedly a diphtheria patient, is probably the same as the mumps and laryngitis that he put as the diagnosis for the first child that died. I think they would be the same. So he, he wrote uh, this series of three very long papers, 20 pages in total, in those days is quite a big uh, writing, about the local treatment of diphtheria. And I don't know whether you can read any of these, but they, they list some of the substances that they put together for painting uh, the exudate in the back of the throat. And uh, 
I'll, I'll read a little bit out of some of his advice in more detail in a moment. But in none of the writings and the talks he gave did he give away anything about his personal loss of three children to this disease. I find that a little remarkable. Um, he talked about the increasing mortality over the 10 years. And we, we even now frequently hear of families where one, two, three or more have been removed by this dreaded malady, not a hint of his own. So the, the advice that he, um, that he wrote in, a, in an article in a newspaper for the benefit of the public, not for the medical people, uh, I'll read a few little bits for your interest. He says, after 10 years of experience, I've found nothing to equal the following preparation given here in English for general perusal. Tannic acid, and I don't know that the public would understand two drachms, tincture of iodine, two drachms, and glycerine, eight drachms. Applied in, uh, internally by means of a proper camel hair laryngeal brush to the tonsils, pharynx, larynx, and nose every 30 minutes in bad cases of diphtheria and less frequently as the patients improve. It can be applied with impunity to infants, children, and adults. And any of you who have tried to get any medi ordinary medications into them would think that's a bit uh, of a tall order. In, in addition, he uh, recommended the good old beef tea, which I remember from my mother, Isinglass and some stimulant. It's a noticeable fact that brandy is the best stimulant. The system under the circumstances seems to tolerate enormous quantities of it which is the best proof of its suitability. See my papers published in the AMJ, that also my evidence given before the Royal Commission on Diphtheria, where I explained the method of application of like application and likewise forcibly extolled the value of this remedy in severe diphtheria. Now that's not the only place either in his uh, statements or some of the ones that I did before, Dr. Kloss, Dr. Dazouche, of pushing lots of brandy, even to kids. And at one point he says that uh, even up to a bottle a day in a young child of brandy, I presume that was the normal size bottle that we know. Uh, so it, you can do all this and without pain or injury to the soft and tender mucous membranes, even in very early childhood. What kills the patient? Not the original diphtheric virus, and that's, this is on a day before viruses had been described, so he's using that in a different context, floating through the system, but a secondary poison generated during the suppurating process in the throat. Next of importance is the mode and time of its application. Nature is well known, assisted by some little judicious management. Nature, it is well known, will very frequently work its own cure. Nature here becomes overpowered in a period of 12 to 24 hours by the rapid formation of this false membrane. I venture to assert that with a fair hope of carrying the patient through such an ordeal, the medical attendant should personally visit such a case four, five, or six times a day to thoroughly apply the means before mentioned to ensure early removal of the diphtheritic deposit, teach the principal, principal attendant how to use the application and leave positive instructions to act similarly between the periods of his visit. It may be said that these instructions entail much labor, watching and pain to the patient. So he's a bit contradictory about whether it's painful to do this or not. It's just getting a COVID swab out of a kid's throat is a bit of a mission. A convalescent small boy said to his mother, I know what cured me, the stuff the doctor put down my throat with the brush. I could breathe better afterwards. It didn't hurt me. I only cried at first because I was frightened. So that's a little bit of a flavor of uh, what diphtheria was like before we had the wonderful vaccinations. And that's just one of his his papers at a time when he was a surgeon at the Alfred. Now, he got uh, probably a bit tired of the argy-bargy in Melbourne. He also came to Dunedin for his health, not liking the climate over there. And I, 
not able to assess exactly how much the climate here is better or worse than what he was in. Uh, so he, he comes on the uh, Ringaruma, which is a boat he travel on quite often. Now you've probably seen this picture before, at least this one. And Dr. Wilkins did not appear on this uh, role of honor in Dunedin Hospital, but these two gentlemen who do appear will come up later in this story. Where did he live? He lived at uh, Dowling Street, a Bell Hill Tower. He's, these are listed in some of his adverts in the newspapers. And later on, he had a house up the hill in Bew Street, which was a pretty strong medical precinct around there in Moray Place, uh, opposite uh, Dr. Holm, who was the sort of medical officer of health that went out to the quarantines and the like. Uh, a, a gentleman called Sidney Muir um, wrote that uh, Wilkins had been a tenant of theirs and lived up there and uh, gives a little bit of his build. He's five foot seven, uh, sorry, five nine, five ten, but very strongly and rather heavily built and wore glasses. He is reputed a clever surgeon. He went to Auckland. That's in Fulton's li Lives of the Early Medical Practitioners in New Zealand, written quite a long time before um, Rex Wrights and Clares, which I'll refer to later. These are, I've got a few samples of the adverts. You just could get overwhelmed by Dr. Wilkins advertising in the newspapers. And it seemed like that got up people's noses, although you can find others doing equally as bad or as much uh, stating what they're. And then one of the earliest things was is exposing uh, his exposition about a new ether apparatus. Uh, but the mudslinging began through the newspapers and somebody who was, uh, a, many anonymous writers to the newspapers, no advertiser uh, was scathing about this ether inhaler. And uh, Wilkins uh, replied to no, um, to no, ad, uh, no advertiser and uh, had a response from Dr. Maunsell, who I just uh, showed you his name on the thing. So um, this might show a little bit of either sarcasm or humor from Dr. Wilkins. Uh, should no advertiser require any more information or if he cannot yet see the difference between the eye and ear hospital and the infirmary for diseases of the eye, ear and throat, I shall be happy to clear his vision if he gives me his own name as anonymous correspondents savour too much of snakes in the grass and I have a natural horror of those reptiles. Dr. Monsell came back and replied, I have always had a strong objection to newspaper writing, and I do not wish to advertise my, my name throughout the colony by a long newspaper controversy with Dr. Wilkins, which might go on for weeks without producing any result. I have this day requested the secretary to call, the uh, secretary of the uh, medical association, to call a special meeting next Thursday evening at eight o'clock. Dr. Wilkins has been invited to attend with his newly invented ether apparatus, in quotes. I shall be there with Dr. Ormsby's so that the society can have an opportunity to, of deciding whether the ether apparatus, which Dr. Wilkins describes as, in quotes, being purely his own invention, close quotes, after years of much thought and study, is not merely a rude copy of Dr. Ormsby's. Dr. Ormsby, uh, was a New Zealander, but uh, became a surgeon in England. Didn't practice here. And then later, uh, Dr. Monsell says he's turned up an old file in the Otago Guardian. It must have been since that date that the tinsmith constructed his ether apparatus from the drawings I gave him. Well, in other words, he's been accused of plagiarism. So they, Julie, uh, the, the pamphlet here is, um, quite long, quite detailed. It's an interesting read for a person who's never had to deliver an ether anesthesia, thank goodness. Um, and and he, he made improvements over what some of the other methods were. One of them was the fact that the whole thing is rebreathing. There's just a bag that they breathe in and out of, like the paper bag you do when you've got hiccups. You know, the, and there's not a very good description of how you get rid of the CO2 over a, maybe a one hour operation. And that's the length of some that are described. So probably leakage of air around the signs. But he describes his evolution of using a silk hat to try and keep the ether contained and progressively moving along to this India rubber bag. And he had an, ex an experience of spilling the ether when he was trying to reload the sponge, the, the 
holding the ether inside this bag arrangement, and it got into the patient's face and caused havoc, of course. So he, he devised a way, which I think is the difference between his and Dr. Ormsby's, of being able to open a tap that lets some ether drip through without having to pour it in two-handedly, et cetera. So I think that uh, there was a difference, but the others saw it as pretty much the same thing. Um, it's the first time that I've come across anything in those eras which said ether should be uh, delivered by experienced people, uh, concentrate the experience. So in other words, specialist anaesthetists. Bravo. And he gave a very strong message in this thing about the relative safety of ether over chloroform. Chloroform had a tenfold greater death rate. It was easier maybe to give, nicer to give, but a tenfold greater uh, in the direction of non-safety. So he, he had his made at A&T Burt's, uh, and he mentions that in the pamphlet. And he also described the name of a jeweler from which people could buy them if they wanted to. He sold his pamphlet for uh, a few shillings. I've forgotten how many now. Um, they could be bought with uh, giving stamps. But anyway, it wasn't a freebie. Uh, one shilling. So there's an Ormsby and Hayler. And uh, the, somewhere around, uh, around here, beyond that side, um, he, he put a, a little funnel thing and a tap, which made it possible to, to recharge. So the Medical Association held a special meeting and uh, to compare the two, and uh, he was invited to bring his along and Dr. Maunsell brought Ormsby's along, of which he brought several back from London when he came to New Zealand. And they published in the daily newspapers two resolutions uh, that there was theoretically little difference between the two. So anything that Dr. Wilkins claimed was his own invention was not believed. And the, they added the association regrets that Mr. Wilkins should have made any reflections on the safety of chloroform. Now that's a very interesting statement because, and that was published in the newspapers, Dr. Wilkins was correct and in the end, uh, chloroform disappeared in favor of ether because of the safety issue. And hypocritically, Dr. Dezouche, uh wrote an article, a thesis on ether himself some years later, and I presented it at this meeting 18 months or two years ago. Uh, and he also included the unsafe, the relative safety of ether versus chloroform. So he maybe got his self educated by either the what Dr. Wilkins wrote or some experience. Now, uh, while Wilkins might have been trying to claim some primacy, the, the former and current editors in chief of Anesthesia and Intensive Care wrote a pretty uh, interesting little article that says that claims to primacy or priority being the first are an unnecessary conceit. Well, it's a pity that they weren't read that far back. And just some more examples of um, uh, Wilkins advertising, and you can see he's occultus and aurist, and uh, it just it just kept going. There's so many, it's unbelievable. But this one's interesting because we now have a new uh, premonition of Shortland Street coming in, where he had his rooms. He lived in Auckland. He lived in Simon Street, which I happen to have walked past every day on the way to varsity, and uh, he practiced down in Shortland Street, next to the Star Office. Interestingly. Oh, sorry, over the road from the Star Office. But um, he's now an agent for Spectacles, which above this it's uh, saying a company in India is making them, but he, he did. Uh, he did uh, do some grinding of lenses, it seems, and caused a fire in his, uh, his premises down in the, where he did his uh, consulting. That's just a potpourri of uh, advertisements. They're not in any particular chronological order, but uh, to give you a bit of a feel for it, um, the Albert Hospital, wrongly named instead of the Alfred Hospital. And at one point he was labeled as the chemical assistant of Drs. Bowman and Critchett. Uh, you have to wonder how the public would ever understand what Bowman and Critchett meant if he's trying to attract business. <laughs> um, okay, so. He, and he consulted in all sorts of places when he was around Dunedin, the, the Criterion Hotel, some cafe, etc. He didn't, he was 
truly peripatetic, as some have called him. Now, Dr. Isaiah Dezouch, who was the secretary and later president of the New Zealand Medical Association, was irked by this particular item, which said that he was late of the surgical staff, Royal Eye Hospital in Moorfields, can be consulted in another place that he worked in. So um, he caused, um, he telegrammed uh, Moorfields and asked, uh, you know, was he on the staff, et cetera. And he got a reply back in the negative from the secretary of Moorfields. And then, so therefore, Dr. Dezouche published this in the public notices of the newspaper. About six months later, Dr. Wilkins uh, presented a letter that he had obtained from Mr. Uh, uh, from, yeah, it was Mr. William Bowman at the time, attesting that Wilkins had actually been appointed as the clinical assistant. He wasn't on the honorary staff of the Moorfields, but he was appointed to be the clinical assistant of those two strong senior surgeons in the relevant years. And then there was the letters had a little bit of small talk, which showed pretty much that they were familiar with each other, it was not just uh, giving a reference for an unknown. So there's um, the bit that uh, Dr. Dezouche had in the local papers, and it's that no Dr. No Dr. Wilkins was ever at that hospital. And he put in the public notices that the Medical Association of the Opinion that the advertisements are fitted to mislead the public as regards the connection of Dr. Wilkins to Moorfields. Did the public know what Moorfields is about? I don't know. So the Australian Medical Journal um, published uh, a retraction of the bit that they had put in uh, from uh, Isaiah Dezusha's first uh, uh, message to them. And Dr. Dr. Wilkins has favoured us with copies of documents which prove incontestably that he was appointed clinical assistant to the Moorfields staff in 1866. Uh, that th this fact is attested both by the senior surgeon, Mr. Bowman, and by the secretary, whose first misstatement, he did give a misstatement, uh, gave occasion to our extract. We greatly regret having shared in spreading a false report to the detriment of a well-known practitioner. Well-known is an interesting comment. The, this uh, journal was based in Victoria anyway, where he had been a member of the Victorian uh, Medical, so uh, um, yeah, Medical Society. I find no uh, evidence that Dr. Dezouch ever apologized for his uh, uh, slandering, libeling, because he wrote it, didn't he? Um, and interestingly, in the same issue that that uh, retraction was uh, printed, um, uh, Dr. Ferdinand Batchelor of this hospital wrote this, this article, so he had better things to do than get involved in the, the stouches and the like. Now, out of uh, Rex Wright Sinclair's biograph of many do uh, the doctors of New Zealand, uh, the earlier doctors of New Zealand uh, in 2003, I'm only going to bring out that one sentence there the language they used about him seemed to be constantly negative and putting the knife in. He claimed he had seven years of training. Well, actually, he proved that he did. Um, I can skip that, except that it wrongly labeled the, the hospital. And the, the comments about the earliest eye surgery in uh, Dunedin, Dr. Oh, Sir Lindo Ferguson, when he arrived, uh, found a state of not many uh, people doing it well. They, there was these peripatetic ones, Dr. Wilkins and Dr. Schwarzbach were peripatetic. A couple of others came in and the editors of the one of the daily newspapers went to watch them at work and put a very good advert for them saying, these are the real eye doctors of Dunedin. And that was the opinion of lay people. But what's important out of what uh, Salindo Ferguson said when he addressed the British Medical Association in 1922, quite a long time after Dr. Wilkins had died, uh, from what I saw of their work, I should say that Wilkins was a good operator, and I have been told that his operating showed what was then referred to as surgical style. But he, the peripatetic methods of both men uh, left him uh, amazed. And that's, uh, there's a book by Bruce Haddon on the history of ophthalmic surgery in Australia and New Zealand that's got a lot more detail on that. Now, nose grafting and eye grafting was another subject that uh, 
cropped up in, in all this. Again, uh, you might consider the local daily papers as the medical journals of Dunedin because there are constantly items about these sorts of operations and the wondrous cures and things like that. And I think it's fair to say that Dr. Wilkins wrote about himself a lot and some of the items didn't actually identify that he was the, it came from his pen. Other people picked up that from internal information that could be told it was from his pen. But one, one story about a, a stone cutter is that um, he couldn't get work because his nose was um, eaten away by a disease. And I think the disease is most likely syphilis that causes that um, loss. And uh, Dr. Wilkins uh, made a flap from the fort, bringing something from the forehead and something up from the lip, which uh, made a, a nose of sorts and he was able to find work again. One of the interesting things in the reports of, um, about eye things is that in foundries, splashes of molten lead, lead, or metal, sorry, commonly got into the eye and damaged the vision. And uh, the, the eye grafting articles in the papers um, were uh, attacked by an anonymous MRCSE, which Wilkins interpreted meant it was a surgeon. And there's only one that I could find that fitted that, and it was Dr. Monsell. Anonymous things, and so that, you know, Wilkins didn't actually invent these procedures, the eye grafting like this was done by Dr. Wolf of Glasgow. And the, that's true. Uh, Dr. Wolf uh, started off mostly with um, conjunctival grafts for. Uh, fixing a lot of different problems that I don't fully understand about the eye. But what Wilkins was doing and writing about was his attempts to transplant or graft cornea from the rabbit, which was the only, he tried on the cat and got scratched and found it was not a very friendly thing to chloroformize. And the rabbits were much better supply and ease of, of handling. And he, he did some experiments with corneal grafts off, uh, off rabbits. Now, there isn't anything I've found that shows yet whether those were truly uh, truly took and managed, but there are lots of um, testimon testimonials from people around who said he fixed my sight when I was completely blind uh, or, or blind in one eye. Uh, some of that could be quite debatable and uh, needs an expert to read it to understand it. So after he moved out of Dunedin and went to Christchurch and he was on the staff of Christchurch Hospital, he, he went up to Auckland where he found the climate of the country was most agreeable to him and the scenery. But at the, the twist at the end is that he went into a snake pit up there. Um, the, the snake of Esk, uh, <laughs> uh, the, twi the twin snakes around the uh, messenger Hermes wings at the top was not really a, a therapeutic uh, symbol up there. It was a proper snake pit. So there was a coroner's inquest into a lady, a 25 year old, recently married lady, Mrs. Mary O'Dowd, who was attended an extremist by another young doctor in his 30s, who happened to also be listed as an ophthalmic surgeon in Auckland Hospital. And she was um, clearly in a bad way. And he just said to her, oh, have you, you've been to Dr. Wilkins, have you? And she said, yes. And then she asked for chloroform. So. Uh, the basis of which she said that became a big subject in um, in the um, uh, court trials. So Dr. Wilkins was eventually arrested and charged with after coronial hearing and then depositions. And he had two trials uh, for murder. And then the third trial was for manslaughter for supposedly causing death by an attempt, uh, an instrumental interference with the pregnancy of Mary O'Dowd. But the, the judge uh, had a lot of biases, and I'll read you just a little bit in the moment about Dr. Wilkins conducting his own defense, which um, he had lawyers for his first two trials, and then the last one he defended himself. The, the husband of the deceased was in the dock as a witness and Dr. Wilkins is cross-examining him. And uh, the husband had said that, uh, you know, they were looking about where some money went, what a, probably some money she paid somebody to do something. But um, he said that the deceased did, deceased did not gamble at the races and Dr. Wilkins interjected or replied, 
The reports say otherwise, and his honor told the prisoner that he was, he went to Mount Eden jail for a while too, uh, that he had no right to make such an assertion. Dr. Wilkins twice uttered interjections after witness had replied to his questions, a proceeding which drew the reproof from his honor. Your, mon your manner of conducting your case, his honor said, is most improper and I will not allow it. Dr. Wilkins went on to ask wit witness if he had given the deceased brandy, uh, and, there was, and the answer was no. Turning to a notebook, Dr. Williams, uh, Wilkins said, oh, but here you say you gave her brandy at four o'clock. His honor, in brackets, warmly, that's the reporter's words, your conduct is most insolent. I will have you conduct yourself decently. Dr. Wilkins protested that witness was not telling the same story now as he did at a former occasion. His Honour, still more warmly, how dare you say that without asking the witness? Dr. Wilkins, pointing to his book of clippings, there it is. His Honour pointed out that the prisoner could, the, that prisoner could question witness as to what uh, he had said on a former occasion. Prisoner said to His Honour to turn up the notes of the previous trial. His Honour said he would not do so. Prisoner could ask witness about anything in the lower court, and if he denied it, he could put it in his depositions. And that was later described as a bit of a, a, um, a bias against him in some of those proceedings. But he brought, Dr. Wilkins brought along some witnesses that there had been no woman in his, uh, in his consulting rooms on the day. And in fact, the last person of the day walked out of the surgery with him down the street. Uh, in his final address to the jury, he apologized for uh, causing some annoyance to his honor, owing to the manner in which he had conducted the case as he was not a lawyer. He wished now to express his, to his honor his regret for any annoyance this might have caused, which was accepted. Um, and then they went away and didn't take very long to come back with a unanimous verdict of not guilty. Another paper quoted the judges saying, you seem to think you're privileged to insult the witnesses, insult me and waste the time of the jury. I've seen a great many low ruffians in that dock cross-examine witnesses and I've never seen one do it so badly as you. Yes, very well, your honor. And uh, he informed the jury that, that none of that cross-examination was of any value. So, uh, Words put into the mouth by another party who attended before she died uh, was a central part of the arguments. Dr. Wilkins died at home and on the 14th of November, 1905. There are two obituaries that I've been able to find and um, they're unidentified as to who wrote them, but I have inferred that they are like a friend, not a medical uh, writer. And I'll just read a few little bits to give a final close on this. So, so passes away a gentleman who was without doubt the cleverest surgeon that Aucklanders of the present generation had known. So, you know, opinions of other people. For some reason or other, he was always an object of dislike to the medical men of the city. In fact, from the time he set foot in Auckland, he was made the object of a professional vendetta that was continued with acrimony up to the last. And Dr. Wilkins was uh, recovered from the trial, went back to the UK, his family he decided to stay there. He didn't like the climate and came back to Auckland. And he's described as having seen large numbers of people in his last days. Um, he was so struck by the climate and the uh, scenery in Auckland and the professional end of vendetta already mentioned came to a climax with that, uh, that court case. The hostility of the judge was such as to create a strong public sympathy for the accused. By the evidence of defense, of the def for the defense, every minute of the doctor's time on the, on the afternoon when the illegal operation was alleged to have taken place was accounted for by the patients on whose behalf he spent it. Now, that's... Uh, as much as you get out of it, except for one last paragraph, which didn't come out anywhere else. Uh, he, had, he found time for mechanical hobbies, and one of his inventions was a new rotary engine. 
uh, into which he sank 3,000 to 4,000 pounds, which would be a huge sum in those days, which he was able to withstand because he had earned a splendid income throughout his career. Now, the true Wankel engine didn't come around till well into the uh, 1900s, so he's ahead of his time. I would love to have seen it, but that's not possible. Thank you for listening to that, and I'd be happy to hear any hear any comments about the diseases of the past or anything that. Sorry. Wait, 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 wait. Yes, it, it, it was. It, was the accusation that he performed an abortion? Yeah, well, an illegal operation. It wasn't called that, but uh, with, with an instrument. But there were uh, discrepancies in the pathologists about whether there was evidence at post-mortem or not of the uterus having been interfered with and all sorts of other things like it could be done without leaving any signs, et cetera, et cetera. People could do it themselves. Somebody else did it, but there was no evidence that linked him to that particular person. And she wasn't in his waiting room, as alleged by other parties. Other question? I'm sorry, I've gone over. He's obviously quite a wealthy fellow. I mean, in mid career building in mid Collins Street, a really substantial house. It must have cost him a bomb even then. I mean, yes. he's rich all the time. Well, we don't know what he came from and what he inherited or anything oh. else. Uh, he came with the title Esquire, which I thought meant uh, the ownership of land or whatever, or could mean the ownership of land. His father was uh, Esquire and listed as a gentleman, but there's no background that sort of tells you where he got his wealth from. But he did get a fairly substantial salary of 759 per annum, which was, and he had enough to buy properties as multiple properties, as you heard. Well, her, her father um, had uh, a fairly wealthy start, but late in life, he uh, filed for bankruptcy. <laughs> Maybe he gave it all to him. Uh, no, they are, from, they are from south of England, not too dissimilar to where he is supposed to have come from. So, uh, and quite a few of the family members that are traceable, those daughters who were spinsters who went off and even Julia Wilkins, his wife died. She didn't get back to New Zealand before he did and she died in a nursing home in the south of England. So there's reasons for connections most likely. Other questions? In that case, would you all please join me in thanking our speaker for a wonderful presentation? Thank you.